Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, April 25th, 2022. I am delighted to be here with Dr. Farooz Nadari. Farooz, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. Thank you. Farooz, to start, would you please tell me your current title and institutional affiliation or affiliation of your own business, whatever the right answer is? Yeah, so um, I don't have a title. I'm retired. Uh, and uh, I... Um, consult with a number of startup companies. I, I think it's uh, now six years. February 2016 is when I retired. So yeah, it is six years uh, since I retired. And I've, uh, I've worked with a number of startup companies. I'm working with four specific ones right now. Um, not um, None of them in space uh, related activities, uh, but uh, uh, but technical, nonetheless. Um, many of the uh, uh, the uh, startups that I worked with, uh, I guess sign of the day now, they're all AI related, which is not my background. But the reason that I can work uh, with uh, startups without uh, missing a beat is that for a uh, at JPL. Um, you know, we normally can divide up the, uh, the job in three buckets. Uh, I say what it is and then I'll go ahead and explain it. Formulation, uh, the, uh, then execution, and then operations. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the formulation, we normally use uh, money from NASA or some internal JPL investment funds to develop an idea the point where it shows promise for one day becoming a major multi-hundred million billion dollar mission. Then we propose it to NASA and get the funding to go into uh, uh, you know, execution. And uh, I, most of my years at JPL, I was interested in that phase. In the formulation. In the formulation, uh, even though later on then I was overseeing a direct threat which we did implementation as well. But the whole idea of a starting with a blank sheet of paper uh, without any constraints other than what you levy on yourself. You always enjoyed that. I enjoyed that, uh, you, you know, and uh, you always know who you can hire to or you can recruit to work in formulation because the people who are used to execution, they come in and say, well, what's, what's the requirement? There is no requirement, right? I mean, you sort of develop, develop the ideas and then put the constraints around it. Um, and so, uh, and you have to go argue to get the seed funds to be able to do this kind of things. So that's exactly what a startup does. You know, they come up with an idea uh, whether they do it in the, their grandparents' garage or, you know, with $10,000 from their uncle. Uh, they get started, they get the idea to the point where they can pitch it to an investor and based on that, get the funding to go the next step and the next step. So I figured I had the right training and background and disposition for that uh, based on what I was doing at JPL. Bruce, if I can ask, at JPL, so much of the formulation is connected to the science objectives, yes. right? Yeah. How does that translate, or does it not, in the formulation stage of startups that might not have a science objective at the heart of what they're trying to accomplish? Um, so, um, with, at the formulation at JPL, <clears throat> the science dictates what you need to do to get that science. In the startup, it is the founder who has an idea to do something. That sort of substitutes Interesting. for the science. Right. Uh, that's his or her vision, just that's, like it's yes. the scientific vision. Exactly. I see. Exactly. They come and <clears throat> they say uh, either this... Um, this thing that we want to do doesn't exist right now, or it exists but uh, the, uh, the competition isn't doing, doing it really well. And so my vision is to do A, B, C, and D. Uh, and uh, 
So again, given my formulation background, I thought this is pretty much the same thing. And uh, uh, except that at JPL, of course, mostly were uh, space related. We were doing things that would ultimately end up in a space mission. The good thing about this was variety, that I wasn't tied to anything. For example, one of my four startups that I work with right now, we are um, trying to build a humanoid uh, that uh, basically, uh, if we can get the price down to about $15,000, you can get a uh, uh, very much a human-like uh, robot that you can have as companion, for example. Um, for the elderly. For the elderly. Just one example. Uh, yes. Um, we also were thinking about, and then you sort of modify, we were thinking about in healthcare, in hospitals. But in a hospitals, it doesn't have to have a human form factor. It could be a cart with a... Delivers medicine. D delivers medicine. You don't have to look like a human. Yeah. But there are certain things that that kind of form factor evoke certain sentiments that, you know, that would help. So uh, we are near to the point where we would have a, a functioning robot. And then you, you're doing things that now it's new that I didn't do at JPL. Uh, is now how do you brand this thing? How do you brand the company and get some funding so I can use that funding to then go to mass market, for example. And what we're thinking right now is that we're going to make a stand-up comic out of the, the humanoid and try to serve as uh, his, her, sort of gender neutral right now, uh, agent uh, to book her uh, as an opening act for John Legend or in Las Vegas or whatever, uh, or book, book her into a uh, improv and to get a uh, digital mar marketing campaign going about this personality that we have created and then based on that, when the company is established and recognized, then we could say we also, you know, going to do mass market and introduce this thing for home companions or uh, greeters or what have you. Um, yeah, and so these are the sides of things that we didn't have to worry about at JPL. That gives it, let me yeah, turn this thing off, otherwise it's going to drive us crazy. There we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's Peruse, one of the one of, one of the jobs I did. Peruse, I wonder if going all the way back to your childhood from your family, if you always had an entrepreneurial streak, and you're really expressing that now in life outside of JPL beyond your re retirement. More than that, I from the get go, I was an organizer. Uh huh. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, even to date. Even when I was working at JPL, okay, to you know, get as far away from uh, you know the technical work that uh, we do. If a family member wanted to get married, okay, they would come to me. You know, you know, can you do the planning for us? You know, what we have to do. You know, uh, and uh, they would do the legwork, but uh, planning and you would organizing, put it all together. yeah, putting it all together, connecting the pieces is. Uh, uh, what I like to do. Now, when you retired, did you have this vision already that you would go into startups and consulting, or that sort of developed no, later No, I on? did, I did, because I knew I couldn't retire cold, uh -huh. uh, you know, after, you know, the types of things that we do at JPL, which is both exciting, stressful, you just couldn't next day get up and have a Nothing. cup of coffee and right. say, I don't have anything to do. Right. And so, it was very clear to me that the type of work uh, I had mostly done at JPL, and also I take on very early stage startups uh, where they don't have strategy. For a while, I did um, uh, strategic planning for JPL. So, you know, to go back to, um, uh, you know, to sort of how I won my career at JPL over 36 years is that um, I'm very curious 
uh, if uh, you know somebody would say, well, you've been semi-successful or successful, and to what do you attribute that? Uh, it is it is definitely curiosity, and that leads to wanting to learn. And I love the process of learning. That's where I'm most happy, most engaged, um, and so. I'm not sure I did it as a plan, but it so happens that my career at JPL were sort of around five-year clumps. Um, as soon as I would get very comfortable in if what I was doing, I mean, even though you know, JPL is a space organization, within it there is quite a bit of diversity of work that you can do. Mm -hmm. I would throw myself at a job that uh, I needed to learn to be competitive. So at the end of the five years. So the first couple of years, it was a learning mm -hmm. process. And that's when I enjoyed my job the best. Mm -hmm. Because I was learning and the act of learning is something that I, I, I like. It's, um, it, you know, and, and the competitiveness. You know, you are now at disadvantage relative to the people who established in that area, mm -hmm. and you just entered it. So curiosity, competitiveness, learning, this is uh, you know, what sort of sustained me at JPL. And uh, from when I uh, went to JPL, uh, you know, I think in 35 years, I think I probably can count seven distinct positions where I jumped around. And then what happens in an organization like JPL, uh, you know, sooner or later they're looking for a senior executive. And they're looking to find out, are there any people where they have touched many facets of JPLs? So that if they put them in that senior, po senior position, they can, uh, they know the domain where, you know, they're overseeing. And if you jump around enough, but not every couple of months, five years is a good time to sink your teeth into the area that you're in. Um, then eventually, uh, you know, when uh, they were looking for senior management, my name would come up and, and, uh, and so yeah, I mean, that's sort of a short story of uh, my days at JPL. Did you build up your Rolodex and your contacts in startup culture during your time at JPL, or you were no. cold first day, cold. you built it from scratch? Cold, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, I, one of the, my more lucrative, financially lucrative um, startups is that I got a call from this company mid-sized company, uh, mid to small, um, from Silicon Valley. And uh, they were contacted by a multi-billion dollar company in Japan that builds tractors for vineyards, for uh, pruning and for uh, healing, is that what it is? Uh, yeah. When you turn the, yep. uh, the dirt over. Yeah, so uh, I think they had read uh, well, let, let me tell you how they, uh, what was the motivation for them calling me. So this company uh, goes to, they're a multi-billion dollar company in Japan. They go to their internal engineering department. They said all our competitors, they're going from gasoline to electric battery, and they're going to driverless. And of course, driverless in vineyard is not like you're driving in downtown San Francisco. It's a, sort of a great point. It's not... It's not Tesla. Right. right. Not too many surprises. Not too many surprises. Uh, unless there's a cat running in front of you. <laughs> right. right? Uh, so how long will it take you to convert our current product line uh, to, to this? And uh, like most multi-billion dollar companies which have been around and you know, they have regulations on top of regulations and all of that, they said five years. Uh, five years, the competitor is way ahead of us now. So they went to the Bay Area, they hook up with this company, and this company says, we can do it for you in a year and a half. And so once they committed themselves, 
they know and like most uh, startups which are start for money. These guys had a deep pocket of this billion dollar company, but time was at premium. And I think looking at my career, they knew that we at JPL work on a planetary program. We're five years ahead of time, let's say in, in terms of Mars. You know we have a 21 day window that you have to launch the spacecraft in that 21 day window or hundreds of millions of dollars is lost. And so schedule management becomes an art uh, that you perfect. And I think this sort of came across in, uh, in the, uh, uh, my LinkedIn write up and uh, they reached out to me. They reached out to me and, and uh, they said, uh, uh, will you be interested? And now by this time, I've been through multiple startups. And if you've been in startups, it's just almost like buying lottery tickets, right? You know, one of them hits, nine of them don't. And so you always also sign up for equity. They say, you know, we're not gonna money that we're gonna pay you, but you know, we give them X percentage as an equity. And then if you work and they don't actually make it, you have to work for nothing because the, com the company goes under. So when these guys came along rather recently after I've had a few experience and they said, uh, you know, will you consult with us? I said, yes. And they said, uh, okay, how much equity are you interested in? I said, no, no, I'm not working for equity. It's straight consulting rate. And uh, I wasn't prepared for them to, you know, on the spot on the telephone ask, okay, so what is your consulting rate? And so I thought I'd give them some exaggerated number. And if they say no, I didn't want to work anyway. So uh, they said yes so quickly <laughs> that I knew I could have said the double the amount <laughs> and it still would have worked. And then they said, so that is the part of, uh, you know, outside the, uh, the framework of a more established organizations, things that happen to you. They said, okay, fine, okay. And then how much equity? I said, no, no equity. I don't need any equity. He said, no, we want you to have some equity. I said, okay, whatever. Then the contract came. I saw they agreed to my consulting grade. And they also said, uh, you have 36,000 share, which I didn't know what percentage it was, what it meant, never cared. And I just put the contract away. So a few months goes by and we do really well. Kobuta is very much impressed with the progress that we have made at, at the rate we're making the progress. So the CEO of the company, one day calls me and he said, she goes, hey, it's just unbelievable. Kabuta might want to buy us. I said, oh, good for you. you know, fantastic, you know, did they mention any price? He said, well, if they agree, it may be a billion dollars. He says billion, and before he can finish the rest of it, I'm thinking, okay, 36,000 shares that they gave me. Was it half a percent, a quarter percent? Was a quarter percent of a billion dollars? And you go through, you know, through that process. And uh, so these are some of the fun factors of when you're working on, uh, on a uh, private sector startups with the ups and downs. And then, you know, you agree with some startups, you put in all of the hours and, and at the end, they just can't make it. They don't attract any investment and uh, you know, all the hours that you have done. So, so this part is different, but the diversity of jobs that you do, again, for me that I like to learn. And organize. And learn and organize, because all of these guys, they come to me at the, first, at the ground step. And you know, to uh, show them a strategic pathway of how you know, they can get there and uh, where to invest and so forth. That's what is very appealing. But to get back to the question, how did people start to know that you were the person to go to for this? How did you establish a reputation before you were in this field? Okay, so uh, in this particular case, uh, the, uh, the vineyard, the tractor for the vineyard, out of the blue, they looked at uh, my... They looked at JPL, they saw what they, you they had looked done. At, they looked at LinkedIn, my LinkedIn. And so in there, I do say that we manage complex projects. Yeah. 
And I also used to teach a module at Stanford on managing complex projects. Uh -huh. So that's also in, uh, in my LinkedIn. But probably for them, the fact that we had to commit it to a 21-day window five years ahead of time, uh, they were looking for someone. That's precision. Precision and knows the pressures of delivering to schedule. So from that one call, you build a network from there. You're in the world at that point. So this was not the first, uh, you know, this was in fact after several uh, things that I had done. Now, so the other thing is that it goes to my birth country. Okay, so I was born in Iran. Uh, I was 18 years old when I came out and went to school and, and so forth. And uh, if you have read a bit of my bio, yeah. uh, in 2000, in 1999, NASA had a couple of uh, pretty embarrassing yes. failures. And, uh, Mars Polar Lander and Mars Climate Orbiter. Orbiter, exactly. And so there was this blue ribbon that came and looked at things and all of that. And they found some technical flaw. And then they found some organizational communication relation with headquarters flaws. And these were their two major findings. And they came and they said, okay, technically I won't go into, you need to fix all of these. And as far as organizationally, we're gonna put one person in NASA headquarters and one person at JPL. And the only communications are between these two point, single points of contact, okay? And you have this one summer, summer of 2000, to completely revamp the Mars program and say what you want to do. And so, which, uh, you know, me and that person, Scott Hubbard, so you were the point of contact for JPL. JPL. I became the program manager of Mars, a NASA program manager for Mars. Um, and um, so then, to make a long story short, we have had, you know, we replanned a couple of decades worth of what should NASA do. As a result of what happened in 99 in this new strategy. Yes, yeah. and uh, And... You know, even up until lately, we have pretty much marched to that plan. Uh, and we have had seven consecutive um, successful uh, trip to Mars. It's been a good run. It's been a very good run. But of course, the most stressful is in 2004, January, when we landed Spirit and Opportunity on, on Mars. And... Uh, so it was a very high visible uh, activity. And uh, then, you know, I was in the news and they talked about Mars, Pro Mars Program Manager and, you know, I had interviews and my name sort of got around in 2004. Now, back to the home country. Uh, so the home country, as you hear from the news, uh, had gone through, has gone and it's still going through a really rough time with a uh, uh, theor theocratic uh, government and and the young people don't have any opportunities and they're uh, they're looking for anything to you know to hang on to and uh, so they saw my name and to them of course NASA is something you can't even imagine. NASA is this magical place where wondrous things happen and only gifted people, you know, work there. And, and it's not political. It's not a sore it's not point political. between it's not, Iran yes, and the US. Right. And so uh, all of a sudden they saw somebody who was born there and now has been part of the Mars program, is leading the Mars program. To them this was such a, um, in my name all of a sudden among the young people in Iran uh, got, uh, got to be somebody to look up to. Okay, so I was the uh, uh, Michael Jordan and Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> of uh, space business. Uh, and today, you know, when people say, uh, you know, of the things that you have done, what is, you know, give me three or four things that you're really proud of. 
I very often now, I run across people who are in their 20s, and they said, I was sitting on the couch the day you know, that you guys were landing, and I saw you on television, and I knew I wanted to go. I mean, these are like 13, 14, 15-year-old uh, kids uh, that I wanted to go to aerospace, go to technical thing, and uh, then I meet them here. And so I have become a rather well-known personality for the Iranian youth. Mm. So one thing- and There's many in Los Angeles. There are many in Los Angeles now, and uh, if you do your research about the diaspora, uh, the in the past 40 years where a revolution happened in Iran, and most of the there was a, a brain drain from Iran who yeah. came here, yeah. and still continuing, the biggest and the brightest come out. Uh, come out. And they invariably end up in MITs and Stanfords, and <coughs> and so uh, the the diaspora, Iranian diaspora, has been enormously successful uh, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, there are so many um, tech founders that are Iranian or Iranian heritage, and so. As a community built here, mm -hmm. and uh, they know me, so some of the startups, when you said how I didn't have to do networking. So many of these people, uh, Iranian entrepreneurs, Iranian Americans, I shouldn't call them Iranians, uh, quite a few of them were just born in the US. It's been 40 years. Uh, they look me up. They know that you know I uh, used to work at JPL, they know that I'm retired and uh, they seek me out. I haven't actively gone and advertised and looked for anyone. And uh, so some of the founders, uh, that the Iranian founders uh, that look me out, they're, they're just brilliant. Uh, and uh, so that's how, uh, I mean, this one in uh, the, the tractor example, I thought you were there, I, I had no prior connections with them. They just found me out through LinkedIn. But quite several others were Iranian Americans that sought me out. Firuz, how locally based are you? Of course, you're here in Los Angeles, but in terms of your clients, nationwide, international, also local, how far out does it go for you? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, mostly California, uh, Southern California and Northern California. And uh, uh, frankly, I think the, uh, I'm not expanding, I don't want to expand. I don't want to work more. If I add up all my startups together, I don't want it to be more than half time, mm -hmm. right? You know, often when people ask me, so how are you doing after JPL, I tell them I'm failing at retirement, <laughs> you know, right? So I, I, the idea was not to quit JPL and come out and work full time again. Right. So half time, probably split about three, four startups. Um, that's about the size that I want to. I, I want to keep it. And of course, the past two years was pandemic, and we couldn't travel anyway. And then also uh, something that I enjoy is uh, lecturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in addition to, well, I have two other hobbies. Uh, one hobby is that I mentor probably about a dozen and a half young people in their early 20s to mid 30s, uh, male, female, uh, either at the school or at uh, their business and all of that. Um, and, and I enjoy that. I enjoy interacting with the uh, younger people and and um, what kinds of industries are these people interested in or aren't they already in they're mis they mostly <laughs> come to me when they are in the middle of their education or graduating or they're into graduate school getting their phds or what have you uh -huh. so they're in that range and then some of course stay with me as uh, you know they go get a job I mean, example i have a uh, i get a call from one of these guys who had graduated and was looking for a job for about a few months. 
And uh, in fact, I was in Stanford teaching this course uh, on complex uh, project management. And he calls and he said, uh, uh, Fuse, I got a job with a tremendous offer, salary and all that. He said, fantastic, I'm so happy for you. What did your parents say? Oh, I, I haven't called them. I thought of you, you know, the, the first person to call. I haven't called them yet. Uh, so it, you know, gets that kind of a relationship. Um, I was married, divorced, and, we, you know, my wife and I uh, got married when we were, like, early 40s. Both of us and neither one of us wanted to have kids. But then all of a sudden, I feel like I have about a dozen kids oh, that's nice. around the country. Yeah. Which they have that kind of a relationship with me. That often, uh, you know, in, in, in another one, uh, you know, proposed to his girlfriend, uh, and again, you know, calls me and I said, "My God, your parents ought to be very happy." He says, "We haven't called them yet." Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's that kind of a relationship, though. So that, so that's another aspect which I actually put a lot of time yeah. into mentoring them, and it started with JPL. Well, a good number of people at JPL found me maybe a good sounding board or uh, I mentored them at JPL, including my appointment immediately after this. It's six years I've gone from JPL. Yeah. Uh, he's thinking about career moves and all of that. And, and still people from JPL call me. This is job open. Should I, shouldn't I, you know, what are the pros and cons? So that kind of a uh, mentorship very much appeals to me as much as any other technical work that I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one is uh, I just love teaching, not in a classroom setting. But uh, once I was at JPL, I started uh, lecturing at different uh, student associations in, in universities uh, around the country, outside of the uh, US, in fact, also where I take what we do at JPL, simplify it without dumbing it down. Yeah. And I just love telling people about what we do in a language that can easily relate to regardless of their background. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite uh, stories is that I was giving a after our lecture at Berkeley, um, it was a public discussion. Uh, and then after I finished uh, talking, um, an elderly lady, she might have been like in her 80s, she came and she said, uh, young man, uh, my nephew who's 12 years old and shy little boy standing to the corner, uh, wanted to come to this lecture and their par his parents were uh, invited for dinner and they couldn't, and he just, bugged me and bugged me and I said, honey, I don't want to go to this NASA guy talk about things that's going to go over my head. I don't understand. And he insisted. He said, I finally relented. I thought I'd go sit in the back row and I'd sleep. And when you're done, you know, I take my, uh, my well, I said nephew, I, I meant to say grandson. I take my grandson now, you know, and, and uh, uh, take her, uh, take him home. So he said, I want to tell you two things. Yeah, so. He said, uh, I understood everything. I, first of all, I didn't fall asleep. Then I understood everything that you said. I said, I'm delighted, you know, I'm so, so, so nice to hear. And then she pays me the real compliment. She said, and by the way, the type of thing that you guys do is not all that complicated. <laughs> you know, when she said that, that I thought that I reached the grandson it. and the grandmother both. So I, that's the other thing, the hobby that I have. So I. Bundle the mentoring, the teaching, public outreach, lecturing uh, with a startup. I still consult at JPL, uh, particularly when they're looking for a strategy and formulation and all of that. And I package it all together and... Uh, keeps you busy. Keeps me as busy as I want to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, with the mentoring, how do students know to get in contact with you? Is that referrals? How do they connect? Um, you know, I have a good um, also um, uh, social media presence. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't put my half-eaten 
uh, plate of spaghetti photo in the thing. Yeah. It's normally talk about something or try to simplify a post or something that happened at SpaceX in NASA at JPL. Um, you know, say it in a language that it's so uh, people get a hold of me that way. And again, as I said, um, those who are uh, Iranian Americans, they know me. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the uh, it's embarrassing, but you know they go around and say you you know you're you're a legend, you're a hero, you, you know you're a role model. That's why I'm studied this and studied that, so they know of me. So it doesn't all have to do with the fact that I worked at JPL for 36 years. It also happens that I am uh, from a country which is now depressed and suppressed, but because of the internet, uh, the young people uh, have access to what's going outside, and uh, they, are, they have nothing to cheer. There is nothing to uplift them. Mm -hmm. And so they get, uh, they're delighted in other people who maybe came from my hometown where I was born. And they see that and they see a possibility. So, you know, what was so special about him? He made it, you know, why, why couldn't I? Uh, and so that's how, the, you know, so I have, whether I wish I did not have that advantage because I feel really bad uh, for the youth in Iran and what they're subjected to. Uh, but because of that, uh, I don't seek them out. They seek me out. So. Now, the work at JPL, your consulting work there, what kinds of things do they reach out to you for? Um, normally, what technology? Uh, you know, should we get into, you know, now I have a view from the outside, you know, uh, for a while I, I uh, was thinking that JPL was not as aggressively uh, pursuing uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and, uh, and the way it is done at JPL, it is pretty scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they, it, it, uh, there is not enough organization to promote it, uh, the, a, a lot of it is strategy. A, a lot of it reviewing proposals to NASA. Okay, uh, so one of the things that you do for startup companies is to you work on their pitch deck. Okay, this is what they take to the investor to say, this is my idea. This is how I can make money. This is how I differentiate myself from the competitor and all of that. And on the strength of the pitch deck. Which is, uh, you know, a, a I, I don't know whether you're familiar with the term or not, mm -hmm. but yeah, okay. So, it's 18 slides, but heavily, you know, crafted, um, and so it's like the proposals that we do at JPL that we have to say why us, why not Goddard, why us, why not Apes. Yeah. Uh, so putting a proposal together and telling the story. So the other thing, which again, um, maybe I did okay when I was at JPL, every time that we had a high visibility presentation to a, uh, maybe a congressman or a senator who would uh, be in charge of the budget, and they were coming to JPL. Uh, so JPL people, you know, being so brilliant, so talented, uh, you know, they go in front of these guys and they want to explain something. They say, uh, let me go to the whiteboard and write the equation for you. And of course, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so the question, again, as I said, because I like to give talks and I like to simplify but not dumb down the topic, is how do you tell the story in a way that it is accessible? And so how you write proposals, how you convey the message, which is again something that helped me when I got to, uh, to startups, is how to help them write their pitch deck because we were writing proposal to NASA to get selected. That storytelling, that, that's convincing them in a limited, uh, well, a proposal is not 18 slides, but nonetheless, 
you know, you don't write a Tolstoy novel. It still needs to be brief and, uh, you know, it is how do you structure it so that, uh, you know, you read the headline and you already sort of have some idea. Then you read the first column of a newspaper and you get a little bit more, you know. And then if you're a really uh, addicted now to the story, you go and page to page 17 and read all the, the rest of it. So that style of writing, that style of presentation, that uh, also helped me. So uh, the training that we got at JPL, uh, you know, and uh, I normally describe people as a T people or I people. I people, and we have a lot of brilliant I people, they are narrow, but very deep in the discipline. Some of the world's best in that discipline. But by uh, necessity, you know, they're just that deep. Then the T people, I have a little stem, but a high horizontal bar that goes over adjacent fields and uh, then you can connect the dots together you, you know and and if you're curious like I was you sort of naturally gravitate toward a t-type personality and which is not easy because when you get out of college with a PhD you are, are a mindset that I'm gonna drill down you know I just got a PhD in this field and I'm gonna go another 20 years further, further down. Very early on, because of the curiosity that I told you about, is that I always wanted to find out what's the left, the um, field to my right is doing, what's the field to the uh, left is doing. And I would go and seek and learn. And without really being cognizant of it, you know, 15 years have gone by and your bar on top of T has broadened. Mm -hmm. You may not anymore be an expert into what you got your PhD in, but you have gotten into so many other things, which allows you now to connect the dots among so, you know, so many things. And uh, that shaped my personality. This is then what I love to do, what I love to be a system engineer. And then, of course, you become program manager and then a project manager. But when you go to Mars, you, know, you have about 17, 18 different disciplines. Each one of them, uh, you know, people have PhD and so you have a lot of people who are I-type and very, very deep. And so it wasn't necessary if you're managing or seeing that program to know all of these fields. But you needed to know enough to be able to communicate to them, to be able to, uh, you know, sometimes act as a bullshit filter, right? And uh, uh, so this multifaceted personality at the expense mm -hmm. of being expert in mm -hmm. really, so that shaped me to what it is. And I, to date, I enjoy that. You know, I enjoy, uh, you know, I'm, let's say I'm reading an article and thank God these days for internet and Wikipedia and, and, and all that. I'm in the middle of a reading a uh, article. Then I find myself, okay, you know, what are they saying here? I'm not sure what they're saying. Then I, all of a sudden I find myself, I'm researching that one topic, which was in the first paragraph. Uh, and then before I know it, I'm like several subjects away from the article that I was reading. <laughs> and then I sort of trace my way back. In, you know. So that's what interests me. There's just a topical question. Of course, in a few weeks, we're going to welcome Lori Leshen as the new director of JPL. Do you know Lori? Have you, did you work with her at all? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, done, I was a Mars program manager. And, uh, you know, NASA has this program called Discovery Program, mm -hmm. which is competitive about NASA yes. centers and all of that. And Lori, who was then at uh, Arizona State University, a professor there, uh, wanted to do the first sample return from Mars, but not from the surface of Mars. So she had this idea of about spacecraft that's in orbit around Mars, and then 
it would lower the orbit and skims the top of the atmosphere. And he, he had a collecting um, device that would capture some of the upper Martian atmosphere and bring that home to, to Earth without actually landing. So uh, she was the PI for that and and uh, air she, essentially you capture air or there's part, yeah, no, particle no. matter what yes, is it? yes 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 uh-huh both yeah I mean, the air is the particle matter so mm -hmm. what's floating there uh, and even though it's upper atmosphere it is not, you know, you, and the fear of course was if you would have gone too far down you would have gotten sucked in and the gravity would have pulled you in yeah so you you, you know it was a sort of a nice dance to hit the top of the atmosphere, skim it. Uh, and uh, uh, so she, she didn't win, uh, that, but that's, uh, I knew her from then. What are some of the challenges you think she'll be faced with, given your strategic perspective of JPL and where it might be headed? What's most important right now for JPL? Uh, a topic, um, so given the context that I was talking about. Brain drain. Yeah. I talked to you about brain drain in different contexts. In Iran. In Iran. Now and it's SpaceX and Blue Origin. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were doing such special things. And, uh, uh, you know, still, you know, we still, you know, it's us who, who does the helicopter on Mars. You know, we still have this audacious things that we do. We're the first people who sent uh, CubeSats that normally just loiter around the Earth. We send two CubeSats all the way to Mars. Uh, it is how to keep the best at JPL. This is by far the biggest, uh, uh, the, uh, the biggest issue. Now obviously you can't compete on salary, so how do you compete? What does JPL offer? Well, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, the, the classic thing with JPL people is, you know, sometimes when you know, we think NASA has a big cache, we you know, we said, who do you work for? We said NASA. Uh, sometimes when it comes to salary, they say, who do you work for? We work for we say Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we're not bound with the uh, civil servant salaries. And we can do better than Goddard and you know other companies, but but uh, maybe not quite as well as the private sector. And uh, it is scarcity of talent. You know, I mean, some of the salaries that they're offering outside is crazy. But I think we need to retain our superstars uh, at JPL and meet the meet the salaries and hope that. Uh, we are not a bureaucratic organization. We're a fun organization. Um, uh, you know, there is some life-work balance at JPL, which is not at uh, sure. uh, at SpaceX. Uh, somebody at JPL was, you know, uh, Gwen Shotwell is the president of, uh, and so they had a uh, uh, women's in tech uh, gathering where Gwen Shotwell, who was the president of SpaceX, uh, was a keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. And one of the, uh, the women from JPL, it says, what is your view on, uh, on work-life balance? And I'm quoting what she said, uh, oh, don't hold me to it. And apparently Gwen says, there's no balance. You know, it's a very, cutthroat business. I mean, there is a job in order to stay ahead. You stay until the job is done, right? So JPL is much more family oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to give them a basket of goodies. It's not all salary. You know, it is the excitement of flying a helicopter on Mars. It is the sense of family that you have. It is that, uh, you, you, you know, yes, when it gets within three months of launch, it is crazy at JPL, but it is not continuous, that kind of pressure uh, on you at JPL. Uh, and that you, you don't get uh, civil servant salary. 
So it's a package of things. And it's the, the way you treat people uh, and the sense of family that you uh, give within JPL. And if you do all of that, you're still in a tough fight with the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks, and we have lost. Uh, you know, I mean, some people which I consider like the superstars. Uh, we have lost them to Facebook, we have lost them to Google, we have lost them to Blue Origin, we have lost them to SpaceX. Uh, so, uh, it's tough. So that's number one. That's the num number one position. Then, uh, and there is the mood of the lab. You know, we went, yeah, I think Elachi was a uh, director uh, for... 15 years. 15 years. 2001, 2016. Yes. So I was there for 36 years. And those 16 years that Elachi was at JPL, I was a member of the executive council at JPL, which is, you know, the highest uh, rank of JPL. And uh, so Elachi is very gregarious, you know, slap the back, walk the hallways, go talk to people. And some of us who work directly under him, you know, sometimes would go crazy because, uh, you know, he would, uh, he would not only communicate with us often, he would go around us and talk to, everybody. And talk to everybody, right? And then there was a cultural shock with the next director. Very different style. Who had a pyramid like this and tried to manage through three people, lock the door, come in the morning, lock the door. And so uh, the executive council was not as engaged anymore. Yeah. So a lot of people were demoralized uh, because you went from a sense of having access to the boss all the time, anytime. Uh, you know, you could jump, which is not necessarily good. Elogy did it to exaggeration, but you could jump six levels and go see the, uh, you know, the head of the organization uh, if you really insisted. So yeah. JPL needs that flatness in its organization. It needs access to some degree to the top. Yes, it needs. So what I see, Lori. Uh, Lori is a very bubbly personality, you know, maybe even a little bit to right or left of Elogy in terms of outgoing and, you know, and all of that. Uh, but at the end, if you ask Elogy, you know, give me one of the reasons, one of the more important, I won't say most important, but at least the more important reason why you succeeded. It would tell you the next level of management that I put in uh, place. You know, he would be gone a lot on travel. And so he really relied on executive council and he handpicked people. So I was at JPL 36 years, 40% of my long career at JPL, I was on the executive council and, and different positions. Uh, and uh, so, Lori, it remains to be seen. Uh, you know, if you want to know whether Lori would be successful or not, you would know it within the five, six, first six months on her appointments. That's what you'll be looking for. Who does that's, she appoint? That's what I would be looking for. And the for. director, it's a clean slate for their executive council? They pick who they want? It should be. Uh huh. You know, and uh, if in fact the incoming is very passive, in that respect, because at the end you have to have your own people. It cannot be a Lodge's people or a Mike's people, it needs to be Lori's people. And so, yes, it's going to take her a little bit of time to, you know, survey the field and, you know, know the people. But uh, I would know whether if she's going to be, let's say, director of 10 years, I would know whether she's successful or not based on the people she appoints. You know, if she comes in, and that is not her priority, okay? It is, okay, I'm the outside person, okay? I represent outside to NASA, to academies. Kind of like the president of a university yes. and a provost, 
president yeah. is outside and the provost is yeah. inside to some degree. And LRG was president slash provost. Yes. And you know, you need that at JPL. Yeah. You need okay. to be both at the You time. need to be both. You need absolutely to be both. And it takes a special personality to do that, and Lodgy had it. Uh, the man never, you know, he never uh, slept. Uh, you know, he, his most famous trip is that he uh, flew from Pasadena to, uh, to Holland, to Amsterdam. Uh, and from airport, he went to, uh, uh, to lecture hall, gave the talk, and then got on a plane and came back. So he was there for the duration of the talk uh, on an overseas flight. <laughs> I mean, it, it wears down people, most people. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, th this is, uh, uh, this is who Elijah was. We touched on brain drain, we touched on personality type for the director. What about the missions, the science? What do you think is most important as JPL looks out past Mars sample return, past 2020? Can I send a quick uh, text? big missions into the 2030s. What are you looking for that will allow JPL to continue to succeed? Well, see, the holy grail uh, for JPL, for at least planetary science, is finding, determining evidence of life outside of Earth. That's the holy grail. Are you not ready to give up on Mars? No. So... And I just a uh, you mean current and past, past. life? Is the, within our tiny, 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 tiny solar system of sun and eight planets and what have you, was this a miracle on Earth? And did the process that led to you and I being in this room right now, was it so exceptionally rare that it is unlikely that it would have happened anywhere else. In our solar system or any anywhere, solar system. Anywhere. So if you take a look at what led to the formation of Sun and formation of Earth, we already know that's common. It so happens on a daily basis, uh, you know, in the, uh, our galaxy and in the, uh, uh, in the universe. So the next thing is, okay, so life, you know, Earth, uh, formed, oceans formed, how did life happen? Because before that, we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about elements, atoms, and molecules, and all of that. Then all of a sudden, you, you, you know, three and a half billion years ago, you, you're talking about RNA and DNA and cells and all of that. How did we go from a chemical universe to a biological universe? And was that, I use that advisedly, a miracle that life happened here? So why is that important? If we find out in our solar system where our sun is one of 400 billion uh, stars in the Milky Way, one of 400 billion. Which and is just one, which is just one, one galaxy. galaxy. And then there's 100, 200 billion of that. If right next to us there is another planet where this jumped from the... Then it opens up the whole then, universe. Then, you know, look. And then you say, okay, so no, no, no. Life on Earth was transported from Mars. Okay, so it must have been that, you know, some meteor, uh, 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 meteorite from Mars, you know, landed on Earth and and... Uh, and seeded the life on Earth. Now, if you can find life in uh, ocean of Jupiter, uh, ocean of uh, Europa, 
the moon of Jupiter, which there is no possibility of life exchange. That would say, okay, now if you can find it there or you can find it in Enceladus, a moon of uh, Saturn, then you know, no, that is a second genesis of life on this tiny pebble. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the, the ways I try to uh, make people understand large numbers, which is sort of meaningless, your mind goes numb, is that it really is true that if you go and to Santa Monica Beach or whatever and scoop a um, bunch of sands in your hand and, and start counting it and count everything on the beach of Santa Monica and then up and down uh, California, Canada, all the beaches in the world, if you count the number of grains of sands, there are more sunlight, sun stars, sun being one of them, than grains of sands in the world. Yeah. Okay, so when you're looking at that, if you, know, you go to the beach and you pick up one grain of sand and say, this is us, this is the sun, this is our solar system. If, in fact, you can show that it was not a miracle that on this little thing, life evolved, then the universe is teeming. I mean, it just completely changes your equation about your presence and, uh, and the context for you being here. So I think still, yes, Elon might be interested in you know, landing on Mars even, I, though you know, I think the man is brilliant. But uh, by the way, I you just like, bought Twitter. I, I just heard that it, it, it's done deal. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, wild. Yeah, wild and unfortunate, um, because all the people who didn't have access to Twitter now are going to have access to Twitter. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think there there are still domains where JPL is. Uh, you, you know, unquestioned leader in the world. Uh, Elon is not going to go to uh, to oceans of Europa or Enceladus. So these are still the domains of JPL. These are the things that you know we ought to pursue. Next thing we ought to probably pursue not a helicopter, which is a proof of concept, but truly as uh, a, a companion to rovers and. Uh, you know, the uh, most of the evidence for past life may be buried, okay? So you're not gonna uh, uh, take a shovel on Mars and dig. So the best way that you can see the strata uh, in the uh, layers of Mars is to go to the craters because uh, when something impacted Mars and dug it up, the layers uh, are evident right now in the walls of the craters. Well, um, the rover can't go there, but the helicopter can fly and look up at the layers and have the spectrometers and cameras and other sensors to uh, look for, uh, you know, for evidence. Uh, so yeah, I mean, these are things that we uniquely can do. And these are areas <coughs> you're talking about in our solar system is where JPL can make these discoveries. Yes, not much to What about exoplanets? Where does JPL play in for exoplanet research? Yeah, so uh, I was, before I became Mars program manager, uh, and maybe it was on the strength of that that I got to be the Mars program manager. I was the program manager for a program called Origins. Uh, in mid-90s, uh, you know, we had the first positive proof that there are planets around other stars, right? Before that, it was a heuristic argument, statistical argument. Meaning that there's many stars that it must be planets. Be. Yes, yeah. But never directly or indirectly did we see evidence of a planet. That's when it started, of course, now we know you know, several thousands planets that have been uh, have been. We're detected. over five thousand now. I oh, think. is it over five thousand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was the program manager of Origins, and uh, the exoplanet was uh, the you know, JPL domain. Something that unfortunately has happened is that um, because of the political clouds of Mikulski, before she retired, uh, the senator from Maryland. Uh, that 
you know, we have lost a fair bit of that to Goddard. Goddard has become sort of de facto uh, astrophysics uh, center for NASA. Uh, that's, you know, and of course, James Webb with $10 billion sucked up all the money. There was no money to do anything else in astrophysics if, except for them. Uh, were you part of the mission that Alachi went to Washington to protest this move to Goddard in, what was it, 2004 or something like that? Yeah, so originally it was actually uh, Ed Stone. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was with Ed Stone when we were talking about this thing and uh, I, you know, Ed Stone I, you know, I'm a growler compared to Ed Stone. He's a very gentle gentleman, player. like you know, and so I know where. Steve, I can't remember who was the uh, Al Diaz. I think must have been the AA at the time. And so when he hinted that they were taking a few things away, including uh, uh, LIGO, uh, you know, the the, uh, the space uh, uh, version of that, I, I forget. Uh, in my age, you forget things. Uh, I remember that they didn't have, even have a paper. All the papers was out of Caltech and out of JPL, and they took the gravitational wave detection in space away from us and gave it to Goddard. I got so heated in that that I remember that uh, Ed had to, you know, tap me on on my hand, which was pounding on the table, <laughs> you know, telling me to cool down, um, and. Then, you know, of course, after that, a lot, but we uh, lost ground to Goddard on uh, astrophysics. And uh, I hope, you know, we can turn it around a bit and still be a player. Uh, but uh, right now, I think they're lead center for astrophysics. Whereas uh, um, the exoplanets, which was the plum job in the astrophysics started at JPL. As I said, I was the original program manager for Origins for it. Where are you most optimistic within our own solar system, where JPL might be able to find life? Where do you think it'll happen if it happens anywhere? Uh, you know, based on, I'm not a scientist, uh, but uh, uh, again, given that I told you curiosity and, you know, being, uh, uh, wanting to learn about different things, talking to the scientists at JPL. Uh, it has to be uh, Enceladus or Europa. Uh, uh, there is still some debate in which one is more likely. Uh, I, I think the uh, Europa ocean is much older, much bigger, uh, but Enceladus is much easier to get to. And unfortunately, the uh, decadal report that just came out, Yeah. they... Uh, downgraded uh, the Europa lander. Uh, so we have a Europa orbiter that's going to call Clipper, uh, which is going to launch in about a year or so. Then after that, we had a Europa lander, which would go scoop the ice from the surface and feed it into a number of instruments to analyze it. And then ultimately, this is now uh, a little bit sci-fi. Sci we are going to get a sort of a warhead a nuclear head to melt the ice uh, from the surface and pull a, uh, a uh, laser, uh, a optical cable behind it and go into the ocean underneath and uh, order there, there would be a submarine that would come out and then investigate the ocean <laughs> to find out, you know, so. Uh, wow. So that... Uh, and it's all frozen? You'd have to do that? There's no unfrozen part of the ocean? No. No, I mean, then there is a uh, debate as to how thick is that ocean. Yeah. You know, it goes anywhere from five kilometers of slosh to 30 kilometers of... Pure ice. Uh, pure ice. So the idea of an orbiter first and the lander first was to better understand and pinpoint where where we can go down. So I was disappointed that that was not part uh, of the decadal that came out. They went with Enceladus, 
which surprisingly in in Saudis we don't have to go down it's jetting things out the plume is coming out so we can fly through the plumes and sample what's coming up from the surface there they have put a orbiter lander on Enceladus that's part of the and uh, so uh, clearly JPL would have to nail that mission we in the next decade we have to win Enceladus orbiter lander mission what are some of the obvious engineering challenges with all you know about Mars going that far out that cold what are some of the big engineering challenges that makes this totally different than Mars? Well, the it depends whether if you're talking about Europa, the biggest challenge is that Europa sits in the magnetic field of um, uh, Jupiter, and so what the magnetic field does, there's a lot of uh, particles that get trapped in the magnetic field, and they're trapped. It's just imagine this room would have been full of fireflies that are, or mosquitoes that are flying by tens of thousands. And you know, as you're sitting here, they're impinging on your face all the time. So these particles which are trapped in the magnetic field of um, Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter and are traveling with higher speed, if they hit our spacecraft, okay, you know, they fry our electronics. So one of the most important thing is how to make uh, our electronics radiation hard to survive this uh, uh, this environment. Uh, so that's the difficulty uh, uh, for Europa. Uh, in some of this, of course, it's even much further away. You know, Jupiter is five AU away, in, and and. Uh, uh, Saturn is 10 AU away. It's just a long time just to get there. Uh, so launch vehicle, uh, you know, getting something to, uh, uh, to Mars. Now, if Saturn, not Saturn, the SLS, uh, the mega launch vehicle that NASA is mm -hmm. building, you know, if that or Elon Musk's Starship happened, you know, a trip from here to Europa may be a year and a half. If not, with the next level, it's like six years. Six years just to get there. So, you know, uh, in a life of a, a graduate student who right. just, you know, so it just, it gets outside the um, interest horizon yeah. of some people. What about Venus? Have you followed what's happening in terms of interest in Venus? Well, we finally... Uh, We're good. I, I'm, I'm watching the clock. Yeah. We finally have a, uh, uh, a mission. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, Veritas. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to go there. It's a very capable orbiter. And surprisingly, NASA selected two missions selected a, a Goddard mission and a JPL mission. Goddard mission is a 45-minute mission. They're going to send a balloon through the atmosphere that's going to sample the atmosphere, and by the time it gets down to the surface, it's fried. So it's probing the atmosphere by the 45-minute uh, mission. We are an orbiter with very strong uh, radar. And of course, we can map it at uh, you know exquisite uh, resolution. And uh, both of them were selected, and both of them will launch in mid-decade, mid to second half of the decade. So yeah, so this is the Venus decade. Obviously, you're very well attuned to what's happening at JPL. You're still very closely integrated there. Well, y y you know, many of these things is not their first rodeo. I mean, That's they, right. <laughs> you know, we have proposed these things and all of that. So many of these things happened when I was there. Uh, you know, and uh, so that's mostly planetary and astrophysics where I, yeah. uh, you know, my playing ground. Uh, the other thing which are I'm not as well, uh, uh, you know, kept up with, is the Earth science. Earth science JPL is magnificent. 
right, with all the things that are going on with the, uh, with the climate change. And uh, the things with the, uh, uh, with the climate at, uh, for our Earth is not something that you launch and you go find something and, and that's the discovery that answers many questions. Uh, for Earth climate, it's time series over a decade or two decades. You send something that monitors a indicator, you know, for seven, eight years, and immediately when that dies, the next one goes up. And so you need to build up 20, 30 years of data set to analyze the trend. And, uh, you know, JPL for the past 20, 30 years and going on in the future, you have really established ourselves in the earth science. Uh, and uh, so that's another place where JPL can shine. But it doesn't have the glitz of the helicopter on Mars or a submarine in Europa. But we sure need it. We need oh, that data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. We also need spinach. But <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> you know, but we go for, for the dessert, so. Peru's last topic I want to touch on today that'll serve as context for our subsequent conversations. So between your education and your career, there's many types of engineers. What's most important to you, both in terms of your learning style, your organization, your organizational style, and as we said right from the beginning, your sense of curiosity. What's your approach to engineering that has served as a constant throughout your education and your career? So I got my PhD in 1976 from USC in digital image processing. Um, and my dissertation was funded by DARPA. Uh, five years after I got out, if I wouldn't have moved with uh, technology, I would have been illiterate. So the technology is uh, so it's growing so exponentially that you know I tell uh, people that they're just looking to you know finish school, get their degree, get their PhD, and saying uh, no, not so fast. I mean that's uh, you know if you want to declare victory after your PhD, five years from there you know nothing. Uh, technology has moved. So. A lot of the things that I'm interested in right now, and I'm sort of doing like self-learn and, uh, and so forth, is uh, they weren't even around in mid-70s, right? AI, you know, conceptually, yes. But in terms of any practical application, you know, they weren't around. Uh, heck, microprocessors was not, they, they were not around, uh, you, you know, the, uh, Apple was just coming out and you know and so if you take a look at the revolutions that have happened I just don't think of myself like if somebody says what's your PhD and yeah my PhD is in electrical engineering but you know I don't consider myself an electrical engineer at this point right I think of myself as a systems engineer so Still, they don't teach system engineering, uh, you know, as a concentration. Uh, and so you learn it by osmosis. That plus your curiosity plus working next to brilliant mechanical engineer and a propulsion engineer and computer engineer and thermal engineer. Uh, you sort of expand in those fields by, and that's one thing that JPL has, people are so generous with their time. Uh, you, you know, it was sufficient for me to knock on somebody's door and I said, look, uh, I don't understand this topic. You know, I've never studied it. Can you say it in a language that I learned enough to, to be able to go and then teach myself a little bit more? JPL is, uh, people are so generous with their time. So I think it's being multifaceted. Uh, recently uh, uh, listened to a podcast, there's a uh, fellow, uh, MIT uh, graduate in the field of robotics and 
in the artificial intelligence called Lex Friedman. Lex Friedman, sure. So, okay, so I was listening, uh, this is last uh, December, uh, a few months ago, uh, a, uh, a, uh, this interview that he had with Elon Musk. And the way, you know, they talked about uh, the SpaceX and the engines that he's building and colonization of Mars, from there to AI, from there to self-driving car, Tesla, from that into cryptocurrency. I mean, the man is, uh, I, you know, I'm very distressed the fact that he bought uh, Twitter because I don't, um, I'm not in the same wavelength with him on many social and political uh, positions that he takes. But the guy is brilliant. And it is amazing how he connects the dots. And then Neuralink, you know, put that in there, how he connects the dots uh, in this set of diverse field. He, he's amazing. You know, just truly amazing man. Uh, I wish he was more politically enlightened, but that's, <laughs> that's for another discussion. Well, Firuz, on that note, this has been a terrific conversation. Yeah, Next time we'll go all the way back to the beginning. We'll learn about your family background, your yeah. upbringing in Iran. We'll go from there.